Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Asani Wharton with uh, UBM Fashion. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining the webinar today. I'm just going to give uh, wait a couple of minutes for uh, everyone to get completed uh, logging in. All right, uh, I think we can get started now. Uh, thanks again, everyone, uh, for joining. Just want to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping, um, uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, tips for you guys while you're um, here on the webinar. So first, if you can't hear or see the presentation, make sure uh, that you have downloaded the Flash Player. Um, there's a button in the Media Control Center uh, under the slides uh, in your webinar console, um, and also, you know make sure that your volume is, is up, too, if you can't hear. Um, throughout the, the webinar, you will be placed on mute um, for the duration of the call. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter them in uh, to the, to the uh, chat functionality to the right of the presentation. Um, and only the presenters will be able to see uh, your questions. Um, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll have a, a Q&A session. Uh, with, with uh, our presenters, we, we'll, we'll make sure we um, answer all your questions. Uh, if you're having any system issues, uh, make sure you click the help option on the registration reminder email. And uh, lastly, uh, these slides will be made available to everyone uh, after the call uh, via an email. Um, and all the links that we uh, reference throughout the presentation will be clickable uh, uh, through that presentation that's sent out to you uh, after the after the webinar. So with that, I just want to introduce our, our two presenters today. First, we have Mar Mercedes Gonzalez, um, the founder of the global per of global purchasing companies, which is a retail strategy consultancy based uh, here in New York, and she's actually presenting um, from Hong Kong, China. Um, so happy to have her. And then, in addition, we have Celeste Baum, who is uh, the head of retail here at UBM Fashion. Um, so with that, uh, we will start the presentation uh, with Mercedes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you. And uh, it's very exciting to talk about the New York Fashion Week and all the different trade shows that are going to be all part in one center and one location. It's probably one of the best places to come and see all this fashion and all that's happening. And I can honestly tell you that, like the gentleman said, that I'm in Hong Kong. I visit at least 50 trade shows a year in eight different countries. So when I'm talking to you about this particular trade show, I'm really talking from experience and from the heart. It is one of the best places to go. Just with one badge, you will be able to go to Coterie, Soul Commerce, Stitch, Pool Trade Show, Accessories to Show, Moda, Fame, and now also Sourcing at Coterie. And we're going to take a time and talk about each of the shows and what you might be able to find there and what's the best way to navigate it. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about buying tips and how to prepare yourself for the show. So again, why is it one of New York's most valuable shopping resources? It's, it's such an easy show to navigate, and especially when the weather is bad or, or, or flaky, and February could be very cold, and 
a September could be very hot and very windy or in some parts of the country with a hurricane. So it's nice to be able to have everything under one single um, venue that is easy to navigate and to get to too. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about transportation to the Javits Center in one of the other slides. The other thing that I find very, very valuable and why it's so important to get out of your store, it's not only looking for new resources and, and different opportunities, especially with different product categories, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's also very important to come to network, to be with other people in the industry, and not only reading all the horrible stories about department stores closing and shopping malls going under, because when you talk to other independent retailers, you will find that the industry is actually thriving. And this is it, you guys are the backbone of the industry. And many of you, it might be the first time walking a trade show, or maybe the first foray into the industry, or maybe we have some new designers. And I have to be very frank with you, this is probably the best moment of opportunity that I have seen to start a new business or to grow a business in the fashion industry. So let me take you across all of the show. It is the Javits, I should warn you, is actually quite a big place. You'll see that there's different levels, there's different entrances to get in, there's different places where the shuttle will take you. I'm going to take you through each of the marketplaces one by one and with the different neighborhoods and their names. So this is an overview of level three, which is Coterie. You can see that there's two cafes in the back and there's different um, areas where you'll find accessories, where you'll find tomorrow, um, which is the Emerging Designer Showcase and some footwear. And we'll talk about each of the areas. So I know it, it seems a little overwhelming until you actually get there, but I just want to give you the broad scope of everything that you're going to find. So level four, so once you walk in, and I'm going to try to give you a visual, once we walk into the show, you're going to see a, a series of escalators that go all the way to the top. They're narrow, they're past a little cafe, and past a, another uh, level, and up there, you're going to find the evening wear at Coterie. And it really shouldn't be missed. Even if you're not an evening wear store or a social occasion store, you will find a lot of what we call date dresses. You will find a lot of little last minute, uh, I have to go to a wedding kind of dress. So it's not only just formal evening wear, but there's a lot of these in between dresses that you could wear for many, many occasions. Um, Coterie is very famous. It's probably one of the most important shows that you could probably visit. And I'm comparing that to some of the European shows. Within the different parts of Coterie, there are neighborhoods. Tomorrow, which is the Advanced Contemporary, and you'll find a lot of the emerging designers. And, and more, more wonderful is that you're gonna find a lot of emerging designers from different countries. Uh, we have had some really great uh, results with some Singapore designers that have shown there in the past and I feel like they might be um, there again. Edit, which used to be its own show, is now part of the neighborhood of Coterie, which again, it's very high end. It's very, just like the name says, edited um, and curated. It has a lot of ready to wear and also some accessories. And again, here you'll find a lot of global international brands. And footwear at Coterie goes with the two different levels of the different neighborhoods. You're gonna find some luxury footwear, some high-end um, brands like uh, Sanguine Morrison and um, Fula and Just Cavalli. So you'll see a lot of these high-end brands that all kind of work together. And again, even if you're not a footwear store, having footwear as an add-on um, to your assortment really closes the sale. So you don't have to have every style from every brand that you might see at the show, but the idea is to really, really curate it and be that fashion editor to really make your store stand out from the rest of the pack. Edit, and a little bit more specifically, is also going to be on the third level, right next to Coterie. It's a little bit more elevated, what we were talking about. And the, and the really nice thing that I like here is that a lot of the emerging designers that show at Edit are actually international. So again, if you're looking for things that you can Google on Amazon, that you know it's not gonna be a markdown before you either get it in the store, this is probably one of the better places to look for these kinds of collections, and especially some of the more established ones. And I know that sometimes as a buyer, we're hesitant to try somebody that's new, somebody that's shipping in the United States for the first time, especially when you're working with an international brand. But that's really what separates you from the pack, taking those kinds of risks and chances on somebody that's new and interesting. So you'll also see, and I should mention, um, going back to edit, you will find a lot of 
very well-established names, too. It's not just new brands or international brands. You'll recognize a lot of the brands that are there also. Um, with Coterie, new this session, I'm going to pass this over to Celeste because it's brand new, hot off the presses. <laughs> Thanks, Mercedes. Um, we're very excited to introduce, um, during this edition of, of Coterie, four very distinct and diversified areas or neighborhoods for your assortments. The first one is Studio by Marist Collective. This is one of our one of our most exciting areas that we're looking forward to. And what you see in this area and experience are highlights not only the products, um, but also the elements of design. Um, the vibe in the area is, is one of a Mediterranean resort paradise. You'll see curated selection of elevated accessories, swim, ready-to-wear, and lifestyle brands, which are all new to Coterie. Um, and then this whole area is going to be hosted by Marist Collective, which designs, merchandises, and manages memorable retail environments for a number of boutiques within five-star star resorts. So they carry a wealth of knowledge, which they are going to be very willing to, you know, share and show you how it's done, how you can change your store up a little bit, how you might be able to diversify from your, your you know, a neighboring competitor. Um, some of the, the um, brands that you'll see there are Fig or Planet Blue, um, Rosa Chow, Ariel Gordon, and The Little Market. So this is one area, again, as I said, that we're very excited about. We'll have panel discussions um, that will be happening during, during, the, during the show. Um, and again, Marist Collective will be the ones that are going to be curating the entire area. So th this is a don't miss. Our second area, which is, you know, is, is beauty at Coterie. Beauty right now is one of the hottest categories out there. So this is an area that you shouldn't um, miss because it can also diversify your assortment from, from the, those of your competitors. Um, this will showcase leading beauty brands um, such as Define Me Fragrance or the Makeup Eraser. Um, and then it is the, the beauty of this one, and not to use the pun, but it's their niche beauty brands, and they were curated by the by celebrity and editorial makeup artist Bo Nelson, which will be present um, and giving tips and advice on, on what to put in your store and maybe, you know, what, what not to. Um, the third one is Coterie at Well our Coterie at Well, Wellness at Coterie. This is, you can discover, you know, products for your store um, that are on the wellness level while enjoying custom treatments within the new wellness lounge. And the brands that are in there are Wave Awake, um, Gaian, Kamal, RX, and there's many more. Um, and the fourth one is our Active in, at Coterie, which features a highly curated selection of both domestic and international brands covering more active um, categories than we've had in the past. So you'll see in this area not only the apparel but other categories within active. What I'd like to point out too is when you get the the presentation sent to you um, after the webinar, you'll see links and the links are live and you can you can click on those links which will bring up more information about the area including the brands listed. I'm going to now give this back to Mercedes. Thank you Celeste. And I, I just want to point out, even though these areas might be new to you, the beauty, the wellness, maybe even some of the active, start with one or two of the brands just to get a feeling for it. Put it in front of the store because this, this whole wellness movement, I mean, if we follow Goop, if we even look at how Saks has redone one of their whole major floors just to get involved with this wellness, I think it's a really interesting product category that has nice margins and can really set, set you apart from the rest. So this is level um, one when you first walk into the show. You'll see it has different entrances. There's a higher uh, entrance and a lower entrance. Um, you'll find Stitch, Soul Commerce, Fame, The Pool Trade Show, Moda, and Accessories to Show all on this level. So we'll take a look at each one now. Stitch um, is, is really, I feel, even though we're going to be very specific about a lot of the different neighborhoods, I do want to stress this. It is your job as a buyer, as a um, credible expert, to walk the whole show. It is so important, even though you feel like I don't do shoes or I don't do wellness, take a walk around, take your time, really look at all the different categories because this is how each of our stores grow and evolve. My favorite example of that is, does anybody remember that Barney's New York used to be a men's discount store? And they're, now they're one of the most curated, high-end, uh, fashion-forward um, 
retailers that are out there. So all of our stores are always a work in progress. So Stitch, I like to um, always visit. There's a lot of ready-to-wear designers. I find that there's a lot of more um, casual clothing here, um, a little uh, older uh, categories also. Um, when we look at Soul Commerce, you'll find a little opening uh, price point footwear. It goes a lot very well with some of the fast fashion that you'll find. And you'll also find some of the more fashion forward um, moderate price footwear in this area too. So it's important to always, when you have your store, to have a nice mix of good, better, bad. Um, Steve Madden and Schultz hang together very well, even though they're more on the higher end of the uh, uh, product uh, line. And um, I, I just want to emphasize again, if you're not comfortable carrying a whole footwear department, it is so important to carry the shoe of the season or a couple of shoes of the season so that you can close the sale and add on to your wardrobe. Moda is really just a wonderful, easy uh, show to walk to. And here, for those of you that are looking for extended sizes or more um, missy uh, kind of fit, this is the area that you want to go to. And the other thing I, I like about it too is that you'll see how trend translates from the really fashion forward aggressive lines all the way down and all year round to even the resort collections that you'll find at MOLDA. So it's important to, again, I want to emphasize that, to walk the whole show. So fame is your more um, fashion forward. It's your more fast fashion. Um, a lot of the footwear people that are fast fashion you'll also find in here too. Honey Punch is never um, lets you down. They're always so motivate, um, innovative when it comes to a lot of trend and understanding trend and translating it into a comfortable price point for your store. I also find that this is a great area to find margin builders. Um, and also a nice area that you could do some private label uh, with too that we could talk about in a minute too. Well, talking about private label, I just want to go back to one slide that I don't have for you today, and that's uh, Coterie, sourcing at Coterie. So this is very important for a lot of the emerging designers because there's going to be a very nice area of made in New York um, factories that are going to be available to us, and their minimums can range anywhere from 25 pieces to 50 pieces, so you don't have to worry about these giant you know, minimums that a lot of the bigger factories um, have. You're also going to find these great factories that do 3D printing, that have innovation, that do outerwear. You're going to find them from many, many different countries. And again, as a retailer, not necessarily just a designer, it's important to go and see what's going on because you're not looking at trends that's happening right now for the next six months, but you're looking at things that are possibly coming in in the next year. So again, going back to being that credible expert, it's really important to walk that show. And also if you have a very good selling item, a bestseller, or something that's become like your signature in your store, this is a great area too to go and talk to some of these factories about developing that collection or that item into your own private label brand. And an excellent example of that is how anthropology private label was free people and how they took it from inside the store, out of the store, into a wholesale that we could buy it and then into its own retail location. So this is really an opportunity, a business of growth, and sourcing at Coterie is probably one of the best places to take advantage of all of that. Accessories to show is where you'll find your more high-end accessories. Even though I must say within Moda and the Tween Stitch, you will find some accessory people too, even some handbag people, even some footwear people. So this is why it's really important to walk the whole show. But here you're really going to find the more high-end designers. There's a nice emerging designer area, which again, I really stress that you walk and talk to these people and maybe even get an exclusive or maybe have an event with some of these emerging designers that are more ego eager to do all of those things. So this is a really great area. And again, accessories is just an easy add-on. Pool trade show, I am so happy that they're doing it here in New York too. We were only visiting them in Las Vegas. It's not a new show, it's over 16 years old, but this is where I find the most exciting part of the market. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of fun innovation, um, the people are very creative, and what I love is that they really, really specialize in limited editions and small runs. So you, this is where you can really take advantage of nice margin builders and exclusives for your store. And that also makes an excellent Instagram post too. So some of the things that we should talk about um, about the show and what's happening are the show hours. It starts on Sunday, September the 17th, and runs into the 19th. 
Um, it op the doors open at 9 a.m. and it runs until 6 p.m. at the last day, which runs until 4. We stress that you register early. The line is really big, um, but the people there are going to take great care of you. Make sure that you have all your credentials. And I should also mention, too, with some of the more elevated brands that you'll find at Edit and at Coterie, too, especially for the new stores, it is important to try to make an appointment before then. But if you can't, then I really urge you to bring what we call a concept book, pictures of your stores or picture of the concept that you want to do so that you have some collateral to show them that you are a true legitimate retailer and honestly worthy of their brand. Because a lot of these people, a lot of these hiring brands have brand integrity and are very selective, which is important for all of us that they are, about the retailers that they sell to. So be prepared to be able to show some pictures and have some credentials if you haven't been able to make your appointment. There are some great transportation options. There's the shuttle bus service that starts running at 8 a.m. They run from all the major hubs, so from Penn Station, from um, yeah, from Penn Station, and some of the hotels that are available from a discount. I hope you've taken advantage of that. And I've actually I'm very very surprised and happily relieved to say that there's even some very um, discounted parking uh, available. I was actually asking if it was $20 an hour. That's how reasonable I feel that it is. But if you're brave enough to drive into the city, there are some parking alternatives for you. Of course, there's always taxis and Uber, and there are some transportation services available to take you to the airport. So please, you know, plan ahead of time, especially uh, in the evening if you're all leaving at the same time. Um, there are a lot of nice on-site amenities. Um, there's a complimentary breakfast from 9 to 10 a.m. And I know that you might be anxious just to get on the floor and start working, but this is one of those moments of opportunity for networking and getting to know your fellow retailers and being able to talk about what's working, what doesn't work, what's trending, what doesn't trend, what new brands you're trying. This is just really, really great kind of intel that you don't get from the Internet or you don't get from sitting in your store all day. So the help desk are really important. They're there to help you, obviously. There's going to be a code check um, and then the retail concert service, which I feel is a phenomenal service. I'm sure that a lot of you have already gotten an email where they're actually inviting you to email them what you're looking for, what your needs are, what your expectations are. And before you get to the show, they'll do their best to help you with all of that. The lounges are also important to take advantage of. And, and I'll, I'll tell you something, especially for the new buyers that are with us today, um, you're going to suffer from a thing called buyer's blindness. At one point, walking down the show, everything is going to start looking the same. That's when you find a lounge, you have a coffee, you have whatever they're offering that day, you talk with somebody else, and you kind of like just brain chill for a moment so that you can continue your day. So um, these are some of the hotels that they're offering, some really nice places, some perks. And the really nice thing about being in New York City is it really is a walking town, and I feel like the weather is going to be nice enough for you to take advantage of all of that. So um, my show planner, it's on your uh, computer. You can go right to the link um, when they send you the presentation. And it's nice to just kind of plan out your day, who's going to be there, what you're going to be doing, what events, some of the panel discussions that they're going to be having, just so that things don't escape you because it's very easy to be distracted and get lost in the time. But having this plan ahead of time is very helpful too, especially when you're looking for things that are specific and you've used your concierge service or you need to ask somebody at the help desk, this is where you take all of your notes and keep organized. So Shop the Floor, I think, is a very valuable tool. I personally recommend using it after the show. I am not a fan of carrying around catalogs everywhere that I go. So this is where I end up going after the show, logging in, seeing all the things again before I make my final decisions on purchasing. Think of um, Shop the Floor as virtual showroom, where you could actually see all of the line sheets, all of the lookbooks with the pricing and everything that you need so you can finalize all of your buys. And also, you're going to find like maybe two or three months down the road that you might want to add something else. This is a nice place to go back and refresh your memory to. So a couple of pre-show preps. First, before you go to the show, it's important to have some kind of guide of what you're doing. Because if you just walk in, like I do, unfortunately, I still do this, with, you know, hoping for the best, it never works out that great. 
So the idea is that you want to settle down, you want to talk to your employees, you want to maybe have a meeting with some of your best customers and talk about what's the best selling self and what the future self, what's trending that you think is important for your store. Then you want to actually review all the merchandise on your floor, all the brands, and see who's been making money for you. And I have to tell you, sometimes it's a really bitter pill to swallow because you're falling over the brand, you work so hard to get it, the brand into your store, and all of a sudden you see that it's not the one that's making the most money for you. And again, I want to stress this. We're in business to make money. We're not in business to impress your friends or your girlfriend, or for you to go personal shopping in your store. So sometimes we have to make those tough decisions and drop the ones that don't make money for us. Spend time reading the different fashion magazines, looking at the trends. Um, there's some great forecasting services that are available through um, the show that you can look at. And, and it's important, too, just because everybody is selling it, maybe it's up to you to take that risk and bring in the new trend and really be known as that credible expert when it comes to fashion forwardness in your retail store. I really want to stress that because we always want to buy the things that we're comfortable with, but just getting out of that comfort zone, even if it's like 2% of your budget, really makes a big difference on your floor, especially we call them window dressing. Like well, that's the one we put on the mannequin. That's the one that calls attention. It's just like being a fashion designer. It's the one that gets all the editorial, but the one that sells is the black pants. So you have to have that variety in the store too. Plan your open to buy. Have a budget. Know what you can spend. Try not to overbuy because that's when you get into trouble. And if you start canceling orders, I promise you, you will be blackballed from the market. So it's really important to know what you can afford and when you can afford it and what month you can afford it. We're going to talk about that in a second too. I want to stress again to please register early for the show so that you don't spend your time spending online trying to look for your credentials. And do get familiar with the My Show Planner because it does help you get a nice idea of what's going on with the show when you're there. So I want to say one thing, too. I don't have this problem as much in New York as I have in other places, but this is one of my pet peeves. You must dress professionally. People will judge you for what you're wearing. We're in the fashion industry. We're not selling pencils or hard drives or water bottles. We are in the fashion industry. And sometimes I've asked people, like, what are you thinking? They're like, I want to be comfortable. Well, guess what? There is no comfort in fashion. That's the bottom line. And here's another one, too, that I find. People forget to bring their business cards, or their business cards are a genetic template from Vistaprint, and then they want to know why they can't get an appointment with an important brand because you have a Gmail account and a two-cent card. Presentation, how you conduct yourself, how you look, really is important in this industry. Um, bring a notebook, a little stapler, because you may not buy all the things that you see, but it's important to take notes. And this, I find, is probably a better way than just collecting all the catalogs and all the line sheets. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, too, after all these years of buying, and I can, when I meet you, I'll show you the little dent I have in my shoulder of carrying all of these catalogs. I realize now in the digital age, it's not important to do that at all. And I'll tell you another thing that's going to happen. If you're the type of buyer that is going to um, go low by low and collect catalogs and line sheets and lookbooks from everybody and take a whole bunch of pictures, the minute you get back to your hotel and you spread out all of your catalogs and all of your line sheets and all of your lookbooks, you know what you're going to do? You're going to start to cry because you will not remember anything that you wanted to buy. So my advice is to actually write the order when you see the goods that you want. And of course, you might find it cheaper, better, faster from someone nicer two rows down, but you didn't waste any time in doing that because if one person doesn't ship you, you have your backup order too. So the idea is that we don't confirm the orders at the show, that we actually write them at the show and then confirm them when we have time to go back, check our open to buy, do our budget, talk to our people, see what they think, let everybody vote in it, and then make a clear decision of what you're buying. Another tip that I have for you is to bring an extra charger for your phone or an extra battery because you will run out. And I also find that it's a Java sensor for one particular reason. The signal sometimes isn't very strong, so it does eat up a lot of your battery when you're traveling through there. If you're doing the show. Use the show planner, pick it up, look at the show book, map out your day. But even having said that, it is still so important to walk row by row, floor by floor, and even all the way up where that evening wear section is where now you're too tired to go look, but that's where you might find a new category 
or a new brand or a new look for your store. It is our job. This is what buyers do. Buying is a full-time job. Also, please take this time to network. I've made some really great friends. You know where? Stand in line for the bathroom, and you will stand in line for the bathroom. And for those of you that may have gone to other trade shows that have been in business for a long time, get out of your routine. People, and, and I'm guilty of this too, we go to see the people that we make money with, and then we don't make any goals or any uh, set any rules for visiting at least a few new vendors. So here I put 10 new vendors, um, which might be a little bit aggressive for a new store. It's nothing, it's part of the deal. But for a store that's pretty set in their ways, 10 is an aggressive number, but I want you to try to stick to it. And then I have a funny note here, or at least funny to myself, um, wear comfortable shoes. There's no such thing as a comfortable shoes when you've been walking 10,000 steps and you're only on the first part of the show. So I usually bring a higher here and a lower heel and try to switch them out during the day. So a couple of buyer's tips. It is kind of important to familiarize yourself with the lingo. I know it's really hard, and um, I feel like a lot of times people actually make them up. So listen, listen to what people are saying. Write it down. Look it up later. Um, I have a funny story about these girls that came to me um, after one of the trade shows, after I did a little workshop, a retail 101 workshop, and she said, Mercedes, we keep trying to make appointments with this vendor, but he tells us 2.15 to 3.15, but it's already 5 o'clock. Like, what, how is he making an appointment? I'm like, he's not giving you the time of the appointment. He's telling you what deliveries he has. He has 2.15 to 3.30 delivery, not time. So it's important to kind of know the legal. Um, and we're going to talk about the more important ones in a second, too. Have you open to buy? Um, plan uh, your orders. We, we spoke about that. Um, you can mark them whole for confirmation, but you don't have three months to confirm it. You have about three days after the show. So this is, it's all about time and agility, too. Take a picture of the things that you're buying. Now, this is really important of the things that you're buying. You can't just walk around taking random pictures of things. Unfortunately, because there's a lot of corporate espionage that goes on at the show, especially now that they have sourcing within the show, so it's really, really frowned upon. Um, the other trick that I do is first I take a picture of the booth's name, and then in the order that I write my notes, I take the pictures of the product. That way there's some kind of system when it comes to that. And also when you're buying, if you walk over to the thing part and you see that something's very inexpensive, don't shun it because of that. And the same thing is don't shun it because it is very expensive. Understand the costing. Understand what your consumer is willing to pay for something, and then make a judgment call based on that because you're going to see some really, really excellent quality in that area of the show. And don't forget, you are the buyer. If something doesn't feel right, if you need to buy one more thing, if it's not right for your store, it's not right for your store, and you have the power of saying no. So how much to buy? These are just really general rules that I have, but at least it will give you an idea. You're actually always buying at least three seasons at the same time. Right now, it's still the beginning of spring, so I'm probably buying around 45% of my budget, my open to buy, at this time. I want to buy exclusives. I want to buy the things that are limited. I want to buy the things that uh, some of the smaller designers are cut to order. I want to buy my international guys. I want to buy all of those guys early because they do run out of good. And then I like to buy a little bit of in-season. So right now, I'm still looking for a fall. I might be looking for a social occasion during the holiday. I might be also looking for immediate. I may be looking for sweaters or jackets or outerwear. And always think about this. The closer you get to the delivery date, the more easier it is to bargain or a discount. Even if you're only negotiating free shipping, it could be 10 to 15% of your bill right there. So this is a very general look at what an open to buy looks like. You have to also plan holidays. You might have to plan events. You know, I've had a, a wardrobe building workshop done at one of our client store. And one of the most basic things that we always say is that perfect pair of black pants, she didn't have any in stock. So you have to plan ahead for the events. You have to plan for holidays, for Mother's Day, for graduations, for spring break, for all of those things that are coming up during these deliveries. Think about how you're going to plan your dollars out and what's going to make you different from the other competition. So we also keep a, a, a line open for your cancel date, which is legally what it means, the last possible date that they can send you the goods without you canceling it. 
your own hand inventory, what we're projecting for sales. And without getting too much into the math, it is really important to at least have three times in retail dollars what you're projecting in sales. Because I'm projecting that I'm going to do $30,000 a month, I need to have at least $90,000 in retail dollars. Now remember, depending on my retail markup, how I got to that 90 could be very significant. But that's what I need to be able to have, at least a three time, a three to one ratio. So once we start really understanding our store, and, and this is more advanced, and I don't want to like freak anybody out, especially the new buyers, but you're going to start learning what percentage of what sells. It's not enough to just say, you know, women's or tops, but you're going to know that you sell long sleeves more than short sleeves, that you sell knits more over woven. And here's a rule of thumb that I think applies to everyone. You usually sell three tops to every one bottom. So if you buy a lot of related separates or a lot of sportswear, just really keep that in mind. And that also applies to activewear. People will buy three different tops to every one pair of leggings that they own. So a few questions to ask the vendor. First thing is, I like to look at the collection without having it sold to me. I like to be able to walk around. I like to be able to touch things. And again, some of the bigger boots, some of the more important brands, they have no time for this. If you don't have an appointment, you're not walking in, you're not looking at anything. So really try to plan those appointments early as soon as you can. Even if it's just the first day of the show that you come in and ask for an appointment, and then they, they see you on the second or the third day, that's a different way of working that out too. So the next thing, once, and here's another trick too. I don't always like to ask what the price is up front. I first like to play a game with myself and say, how much will my customer pay for this? How much will they pay for a wool sweater versus cashmere versus cotton versus acrylic? And then I ask for the price. And usually I try to get at least a 2.5 markup. And if I can get a better markup, then all the best. But if, you know, if I feel like I could sell it for $50 and my wholesale dollars is 50, that's not going to work. Um, so understand what your customer's price resistance is and not just the price that you're paying for the goods. Um, what is your cancel date? Again, that's the last possible date that the vendor can ship you something without you legally canceling the order. So if you're looking for dresses for, you know, uh, Valentine's Day in February, you don't want a cancel date of 2.15 because Valentine's Day is 2.14. You probably want something at the end of December, which now brings me to a start date. You don't want those Valentine Day dresses to come in October because they might have them already in stock when you're coming to the show in September. So a start date with a real number not as ready um, is really important. So in the case of those Valentine dresses, I would probably have a 12.15 start with a 12.30 cancel. That way it gives me six weeks on the floor. I could price them, tag them, steam them, and put them out. And you know that people are going to buy that Valentine's Day dress when? The day before Valentine's. But six weeks is usually the rule of thumb. So what are your terms? Are you factored? This is a very nice way of saying how am I paying for the goods. Usually with a new store, most likely with a new store, you're going to be paying by credit card. It is absolutely important that you do not give your credit card at your show. You want to be able to take your orders home. You want to be able to get an invoice from the vendor. You want to match your invoice to your order. Make sure that the colors are correct, the sizes are correct, the prices are correct, and then give them your credit card authorization form. Where do you ship from is, or FOB, which is a more technical word and part of that lingo that you should be learning. It's very important because if you're buying from an international brand and there's you know, shipping from Portugal, you're going to have to pay shipping on that. So now the price that you thought were the goods are a completely different price. Um, if you're shipping from New Jersey and my store is in New Jersey, that becomes now a negotiating tool. Hey, can you give me free shipment? I'm only 30 miles away from you. And that could be something that you could ask for too. Do you have at once goods, which is always important because we're always filling in and that's more like immediate. What is your size run and how do they come packed? And this is really important, especially when it comes to footwear, because sometimes they come packed in case packs of 24, um, and they may come with a, a smaller scale or a bigger scale. So you have to make a determination if you really want that many shoes, especially if we're buying them as an add-on or as an accessory. If it's an open scale, that means that you can buy what sizes you want and how many you want, but usually they do have a minimum. 
What is your opening order? Oh, and I should mention one more thing. Especially when it comes to the young contemporary and the, most of the people that you'll find at Cain and some at Moda is that they will have pre pack meaning that they might be size small, medium, and large, 222, and the 222 is a six-piece pre pack You cannot order 111, okay? I know I've tried many, many times and been rejected, but in 25 years, a pre pack is still a pre pack so what is your opening order? Now, this is a nice way, and again, a lot of new buyers, um, because we're still a little bit shy and a little bit intimidated, our first question is, you know, what is your minimum? And if you walk into a booth and that is your first question, already they know that you don't know. So they may not pay the right attention to you, or they may tell you an exact, you know, exorbitant number. So that question I usually ask towards the end of my conversation. And to be honest with you, I'm just asking to be kind of nice because at the end of the day, we're only going to buy the things that we're comfortable with. And it becomes a negotiation. If the minimum opening order is $500 and you're at $400, then you just say, hey, listen, I'm very comfortable in buying this. I think it's going to do well. It's the first time that we do business. Can you work with me on it? And I would say that 99% of the time, they will say okay. Now, there's always that one guy or that one girl, right, that will say no, and the answer to that is you walk away. I mean, I always try to hand in the order after the show. I'll email it, or better yet, I have somebody in my office email it so I don't get the blame. And 99% of the time, whoever is getting that email is just going to process the order. And if they do call you and they say, hey, you know, Mercedes just sent this order and it's still not meeting my minimum, I ask them once again. Now that you have your order in front of you, isn't there anything you can do because this is only what I want to buy? And the answer is either going to be yes or no. And as a buyer, I stress if the answer is no, then walk away. There's always somebody else. Now, we could teach a whole class on this last question. Is this the best you can do? But I've already given you a couple of hints. Almost everything is negotiable. If it's not shipping, if it's not on immediate, if it's not on a, a flat-out discount at the beginning of the season, there's always something that can be negotiated. Even with some of the higher brands that really don't ever, ever discount, you could ask them for a postcard, you could ask them for a tote bag, a gift of purchase, something that you can entice your customers with that they can offer for you. And let me tell you, those postcards really go a long, long way. So after the show, it is so important that you follow up. Um, the people that were going to send you line sheets, and I always tell them, like, I take their cards and I'm like, I'm going to harass you if you don't send me the line sheets. And usually they're pretty good about doing that. And don't forget, you could always go to Shop the Show to look at the line sheets and the lookbooks on there. Review the pictures within your orders with the sales team. Go over all of your orders. Edit your orders. So this is a really valuable thing that you can do. Just because I wrote an order with 12 pieces doesn't mean I have to buy all 12 pieces. I could edit, I could change, I might change the delivery date, I might move something from one order to another order. That's all fine and dandy before you confirm the order. Once you confirm the order, that's pretty much set in stone, especially with the vendors that are cut to order. That means that they have to pay in advance for the fabrics, for the material, for the for all the resources to make your products, and then if you cancel the order, trust me when I tell you, they will not forget that, ever. So you're gonna confirm your orders. Now, I just wanna tell you one more thing about that. Even though we've done all of our work, we've done, we've placed our orders, we confirmed our orders, you still have to follow up on your orders. You still have to call them right before the cancel date. Are my goods coming? Are they on time? Uh, are they coming? Are they on, on time? And I have to tell you, after all of these years, probably 30% of the goods that I buy pre-season are canceled. Either they didn't make them or they were the fabric ran out or something was damaged or they're too late in the season and I, I don't want them anymore. So it is really, really important for you to follow up on your own orders. So um, this is a team uh, that's going to be there at UBM. Um, Celeste, do you want to introduce everybody? Sure. Um, oh, no. I'm Celeste Bell. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm Celeste Bohm. I am the VP of Retail Engagement for UBM Fashion. I have on our women's side, I have five specialists um, that have, you know, collectively worked on the wholesale and retail side for many, many, many years. Um, I have Susan Chenis, Gail Alcalt, Karen Greenberg-Budd, Sandy uh, 
Shapiro and Misha Teichgraber. And all of them will be on show site to help with anything that you might, you may need. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're there to assist you. And you can also reach out to us prior. So if you need any help before the show, we're here to do that also. And I, and again, our, our number is there. It's 310-857-7316. Or you can reach us via email at retailrelations at ubmfashion.com. And this is my information um, for the office and our website. And we have a lot of how-to and retail 101 videos that are available on YouTube. And, um, and now we're going to be open for any questions. We, we have a few questions. And again, if you would like to um, ask a question, please use the chat box in your lower right-hand corner. The first question, Mercedes, we have is, what do you suggest the cutoff as far as margin percents for brands to consider them a success or profitable? Well, I can just tell you from what we're working with. So I should just tell you, our group of stores, we have over a little over 200 retailers um, in the U.S. and internationally. And once our net um, gross margins are figured out, we're maintaining about a 46%. So anybody under 46%, they're in jeopardy. Anybody under 30, we drop them completely. Okay. The next question is, what is a good proportion for different categories within ready-to-wear? Example, what's the, what's the percentage of tops to pants to jeans to skirts to dresses? So every store has their own personality. The rule of thumb usually is three tops for every bottom, which I feel like we all can even go four tops for every bottom. Um, as far as percentages-wise, it really depends also on the season because I feel like people will buy more bottoms, more pants in the wintertime, obviously, more skirts in the summertime. We're seeing a nice trend in skirts, especially conversational skirts that have embroidery or fringe trims. And here in Europe, we've seen a lot of transparent skirts that are laid over pants, which is really, really kind of forward. And I haven't seen a lot of that in the States. So there is not one real specific answer to that, but it's really about understanding the personality of your store. And when I say that, the funny thing is that the minute you feel like you have a rhythm going on, it completely changes. So you always have to be on top of those numbers. Okay, another question. As a new buyer, how do you know for sure how to tell that a new brand is good quality? What brings in the most revenue from your expertise, domestic quality hands on brand or overseas generic cheaper brands? Oh my gosh, that is such a loaded question, but here's my best answer. <laughs> um, it, it, it really is. So uh, let me just think about this for a second. The best question you could ask when you're looking at a, at a, at a brand, at a line at the show, is if you're looking at a production sample. So they may not have a production sample for the spring collection because that's brand new, but if they have any immediate, ask them if any of those samples are production samples. And what that means is a sample made in the factory that makes production. Because what happens a lot of times is that they'll make a sample at a, you know, uh, a sample room or a, um, a, a tailor uh, shop, and that sample is absolutely perfect. And it's not going to translate well when we get into production. And your other question really is about perception of um, perception of value. Because you could take two blouses. I could take an Italian silk blouse, and that has higher perception of value. And I take a polyester Chinese blouse, and it has a lower perception of value. But which is really the better, sh the better blouse? The silk blouse, have you ever worn silk on a humid day? You want to kill someone. It, you have to dry clean it. It doesn't wash well at all. It doesn't feel that well. It doesn't breathe well. It doesn't take color well. It's not really exactly the best product. And now we take this Chinese blouse in polyester. Polyester is like a miracle fabric. You could set fire to it and wear it the next day, and it's wrinkle-free. It's amazing. And the Chinese, you know, for all that's said and done, for the last 25 years have done nothing but build supersonic factories where one, the first one is production run, to the 1,000 in the production run all has the same quality. So to answer your question, it really depends on the brand, and it depends on what they're showing you. If it's a first sample, 
a counter sample or a production sample? Great, thank you, Mercedes. The next question is, as a new buyer, will brands be asking to see our open to buy plans? No, nobody asks for an open to buy plan, but they will ask you, I mean, I like to go prepared, right? I, I like to circumvent all of these questions. So what I like to do is put together, it's not a business plan, it's a concept book. So a concept book has pictures of my store or what my store is gonna look like. And, and this is very important. It does have a list of other brands that I want to carry in my store. So maybe you haven't been to Nanette Lepore and you haven't been to Millie and you haven't been to Tiddy and you haven't been to any of those guys yet. But if they see that they're all hanging with each other, if they see the element of design that you want in your store, if you have like a little idea of how you want to market your, your social media, if you could present all of that, think of it as like a really – like glorified Pinterest scrapbook of your dream store, that will help interpret very quickly what you're trying to establish, especially with the brand. And I'll tell you, after all these years, if people ask me, like, what brands do you carry? I always draw a blank. So to have everything already kind of preset really makes it very professional. Okay, any recommendation or resource recommendations on how a new online boutique should determine it's open to buy? Oi. So, I don't even know where to start with this question because um, you're not going to sell anything online. So, that's my projection for you. And I hate to sound so miserable, but I feel like if I'm not such a drama queen when I talk about online business, nobody ever takes me seriously. I do have a video um, on YouTube on how not to start an online business, but here's the bottom line. Unless you have gazillions of dollars, not even millions, gazillions of dollars, you, you, fashion business is not an online business. People like to touch and feel. And especially some of the brands that you're going to have to bring online have to be new brands. That's not how the consumer shops. We don't shop a new brand online. So if there's any designers out there that their um, method of you know, getting to the market was by manufacturing and opening their own line, own online uh, shop. It is probably the worst business plan um, or bad advice that you have gotten. So again, it, that's a whole big giant conversation. But if you're really, really set, no, I'm not even going to give you that advice. No, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. You won't make any money. Open a brick and mortar store. There's so many great available spaces right now. Okay, the next question is, any tips on first-time buyers opening a new boutique, how to figure out how much to buy and how much to mark up right away? Yes, so there is actually everything in our business has a mathematical formula. Um, usually what we do is we take the usable square footage of your store. So just because you're renting out 1,000 square feet doesn't mean that all 1,000 square feet is rentable, right? I mean, usable. You have your cash wrap, you have dressing rooms, you have a window, you have a utility closet. So we have to deduct from all of that to come up with the actual usable square footage. And I would say in worst case scenario, $375 a square foot. And again, if you're in New York and you're not selling $2,000 a square foot, you're dead. If you're in you know, some parts of Kentucky and you're selling $200 a square foot, you're probably doing fine. So it really depends on the geography of where you are, but I would say like a middle number is $375 a square foot. So you take that number and multiply it by your usable square footage, and that will give you what your sales should be a year. And from that, you decide, you know, every month what you should have in order to maintain those sales. So I'm just going to tell you one more curious thing about that. There is definitely a way when it comes to sales, like good months and bad months. So everybody thinks like, oh, I want to open up my store right before Christmas. That's probably like the worst time to open a store because we are boutique businesses. People, the month of December, people go to a department store to buy price. They buy whatever is cheap, whatever is on sale, 99% off, and here's a, a double coupon. We cannot compete with that. We don't want to compete with that. So our probably highest months in the fall are September, October, and definitely November. November is the peak because people are buying um, outfits for their Christmas parties, for their Hanukkah parties, for Thanksgiving. So they were still buying for them. But when it comes to actually Christmas purchases in December, it's a terrible month for the boutique. I actually tell a lot of people that 
you know, take some vacation time off because market in January, February, and March are excellent. Okay, great. Thanks, Mercedes. Can you advise where I can look for sourcing to start a new clothing line? I need to find sourcing with a manufacturer with low minimums. Excellent. So this is this is definitely the place to go. You're, I'm really excited. We actually personally know some of the factories from New York City that are going to be um, showing at sourcing at Coterie. They're very approachable. Um, they're very easy to work with. A lot of them, you don't even ha have to have a lot of technical packs with them. If you have a sample, they can help you do a duplicate. There's going to be some wonderful Chinese factories. I don't know if any of our um, South American friends are going to be there too. But um, again, there's going to be such a nice variety of uh, uh, MOQ, low MOQ, so that's another industry lingo word for you, um, minimum order quantities um, that are going to be available. And again, here's a, another rule of thumb for the designers. If you can't sell 100 dresses, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. And that's a whole different thing that we should talk about. But a minimum of 100 pieces I think that really puts you at a good economy of scale to get good pricing on your fabrics and your production costs without going over the, the budget. Okay, this is a follow-up to um, the question regarding online, Mercedes. This is, I know sure. you're, you don't believe in online, but I'm opening online, but I am opening an online store with a pretty good following already. So how do we figure out how much to buy for online? Okay. I'm just going to really stress this again. I don't care if you have a million followers, they don't buy. But now having said that, I would start very slow. I would say, I would probably, that's a good number. I want you to make the most, I hate that I'm giving this advice, first of all. This is going against every grain of my consciousness. But I would say do not spend more than $5,000 on your inventory. And within that $5,000, I would try to get the most variety that I possibly can, and especially keeping in mind good, better, and best pricing. So, yeah, that's my best advice for that. Okay, here's another online um, question, Mercedes. Hi, if, if I'm a new online buyer, what do you suggest as far as providing proof of the legit that I'm a legitimate online business? I think what... So here's the other thing. If you're talking about some of the high contemporary brands, they're not going to sell you. No matter, um, they already have like their resources online. They don't want to saturate their online business. There's a Revolve, there's Shop Off, there's some of those big guys that they, made a porte that they want to sell to. Um, so that's going to be very, very difficult. And again, this is where you want to, you know, do the networking and see who you meet that knows somebody that knows somebody that will do you a favor because that's probably the only way you're going to get to them. Having said that, with some of the more junior, um, more fashion-forward, fashion um, kind of vendors, uh, they would probably just want to see like a snapshot of your website, what it looks like. If you could bring it up on your phone, that's always very helpful. And they also want to see your social media presence because that would probably impress them more um, than anything else. And also who you're using as your platform. I think those are the three things that they really look at. Okay. What margins are best to work on for a new clothing retailer? For a, you, uh, this is a retailer or a designer asking? A retailer. Retailer. retailer? Okay. Yeah. So he, you want me to keep the secret? Um, you get as much as you can. That's the rule. So you could always mark something down that didn't sell because you marked it up too high, but you can't mark something up once you've put it at that price. Trust me, people will remember that. They don't remember what they ate for lunch, but they will remember the price of the dress you had in the window yesterday. Um, now, having said that, you also have to follow manufacturer standards. Like if there's an MSMR that they have because they're selling to a department store, or you might want to Google them to see who else might have them. Um, you might want to follow the manufacturer standard, but especially when you're working with some of the emerging brands, if you're working with some of these international brands that they can't Google and you won't find them on Amazon, those are the ones that I actually mark up as much as I can. And again, knowing what my customer is willing to pay for things. Like, I know that my customer is willing to pay for things that are ethically made, that are made um, in small factories, that are fairly traded. Like, they will pay extra for those kinds of um, value added. Um, so I would take advantage of all of those perceptions too. 
But I, I, let me just give one more rule. I would not buy anything that I couldn't get at least a 2.3 markup. So that's my lowest standard, and there is no high standard. Okay, we're at, we're at the one hour mark right now, but we have a grouping of questions still unanswered. So we're gonna to continue to answer and plow through some of these questions. So if you can stay on, please do so. If you need to hop off, we will definitely send out the, um, the presentation a few hours after the webinar is completed. So the next question is, hello, this is Anna. Hello? Hello, this is Anna from Treta Porter, Ashens. As a small business owner, Amazon and online shopping has really impacted my boutique. Our suggestions to stick to basics and emerge into yoga, athletic, and wellness section, and what do you think about Shoptique? Because I have just partnered with them. I am surviving by hosting events monthly, pop-up shops, and fashion shows. Okay. If, I'm going to be very tough with you, and I'm really sorry that I haven't met you in person to hug you after I'm so mean to you. But. There is no reason why Amazon should be your competition, none. You should not be buying commodities. You should not be buying basics. I do not go to a boutique to buy a white T-shirt unless it's a fabulous white T-shirt made of Peruvian silk cotton that is so rare that I could only find it in your boutique. That is not even an option. Um, I do like the idea of athletic wear, especially when you mix it in with the Wellness, I feel like that probably is a very unventured um, niche in boutique retailing. I feel that that's something that Amazon couldn't do because you want to feel the products, especially the wellness products, the creams, the, the vitamins, the lotions, uh, all those kinds of products that are available now. And um, wait, there was another part to that question, so that's what was it? The, oh, the pop-ups. And I love the idea of doing yeah. the pop-ups. So if you're getting traction from doing the pop-ups, I'm going to guess that maybe the location of your store is the problem and not Amazon. And did you answer the question about Shopteeks? Oh, so Shopteeks, um, I'm just going to stay very neutral with them. I don't have any good experiences with them from any of our clients that have used them. I feel that once you're on shop peaks, you become a predator to a lot of other businesses that are seeking to get your business. But again, it's just like having an online shop. If you have um, social media presence, I'm telling you, I'm also, I'm also a retailer. Like I personally own stores. So I know that when I post something on Instagram, if people want it, they call the store. I don't have a website, I don't buy from it, but they already trust the brand and they trust the store. So that's that kind of intimate relationship that you just can't buy from a generic website. Okay, this next question, um, Mercedes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one. The question is, is there an area of clothing or accessories made in the U.S. within the show? Um, we don't have a specific made in the U.S. Um, area, but if you do want a listing of brands that are made in the U.S., if you will either call the number on the slide, the 310-857-7316, or email us at retailrelations at ubmfashion.com, we'll be very happy to provide you a list. The next question is, any example of concept books that we can look at? Um, uh, no, but I'll, I'll tell you what they, what they should include. They should include merchandising. It should include, actually, the first page should have a little bit about your customer. And this just shows the brand that you know who your target customer is. And don't do it based on, you know, demographics, like she's 30 years old to 40 years old and she has a kid. Like, really get to know her, name her, tell me what she likes, not who she is, but who she wants to be and what she aspires to. Understanding her in that intimate level is what really separates you from a drone on a website that's doing these, you know, styling boxes for you. Um, the other part has to be the brand that you're carrying, the way that the store is going to look, the location of the store. Is it a storefront? Is it in a shopping mall? Is it in a commercial center? Is it on a main street? That's very important too. And then you know what's really nice, too, is that, you, and especially if you're showing this to a landlord, that you actually have a break-even analysis. But that's not important or necessary to show one of the brands. But those are the elements that you want to have. 
who the target customer is, what the store is going to look like, where is the store located, your social media, and the other brands that you're homing. Okay. Another question is, how would you recommend selling a seasonal product such as swimwear if not through an online marketplace? Is this a, a retailer talking, or is it a? Um, the, the, oh, so this, this is a retailer. This is a retailer. Okay. The retailer. okay. So this is what happens with swimwear. If you have brands that people know, it becomes a commodity. So if it's like Jensen Swimwear, I'm going to go on Amazon, who's going to ship it to me tomorrow, Prime Free. And how do you compete against that? You can't. And if you have a brand like some of these really beautiful Colombian brands or Brazilian brands, right, that we do have at Coterie, um, the people don't know how it fits. And buying swimmer is so intimate and so personal that all they're going to do is buy stuff and return it, buy stuff and return it. And if you don't have an excellent return policy and even offer free shipping, you cannot compete with the people that are doing this, you know, hard and online with million-dollar budget. So if you're going to just stick to swimwear and you want to do it, maybe the idea is to do it um, in a retail location that's also mobile where you go to different events, you go to different festivals, you go, you know, you might start out in Maine in the summertime and end up in Florida in the wintertime with the snowbirds. But to sell it just online, if you sell a brand, it's going to become a commodity and people are going to shop. Shop to has it cheaper. And if it's a brand that they don't know, they're going to take a chance on it. Okay, I have a mobile boutique trailer and will be doing pop-up shops and home parties. How should I determine how much to buy since I don't have a brick and mortar? My trailer is 10 by 6. Okay, so it, now it, this is a little different math, but it's basically the same math. You have to take, if you've already done a couple of shows, then you know what your turnover is. Do you sell 30% of your goods at one event? Do you sell 50% of your goods at one event? And then that's how you kind of take it together um, in order to figure out the ratio. But the ratio is always the same, whether it's brick and mortar, whether it's online, which I don't recommend, whether it's a mobile, it's always a three-to-one ratio because that's the proportion of what people want to look at in order to have enough variety in order to be able to sell them. So, and if it's your first time doing a mobile show, then I would probably just start not so much with a dollar amount, but with the right amount of variety that I, would be interesting enough for people to come and see me at the show or at the event that I'm doing. Okay, the next question it is, what about online accessories, fair trade merchandise? They're a dime a dozen online. Oh, my gosh. Does it, you know, I really want everybody to subscribe to internetretailer.com. It's free. They give you all the real numbers. You know, when people say, you know, that nasty gal sold $100 million, great. She sold $100 million in a day, but she lost $70 million in order to sell $100 million. It's all about profitability. It's not about how much you can sell online. And I feel like that's what we're missing. Um, fair trade organic, natural, you know, indigenous people, cooperatives, women-owned, all of those kinds of buzzwords are great, but people still want to touch and feel it. Um, yeah, they do. And especially when it comes to accessories, because they're so personal, you want to see if it fits, if it's, uh, what the proportion is, what it looks like. Unless, of course, it's a name that they already know and they're buying replenishment. And by the way, there's a lot of those to show. Okay, the next question comes from the brand side, Mercedes. What would be the best way to okay. approach buyers at, at the larger department stores? Okay. Oh, my God. Today is uh, – I'm not giving good advice today, is it? I don't recommend you going to the department store. I um, feel that a lot of the department stores are in jeopardy. That's why it's uh, such a good moment of opportunity for the boutique to really – people are still spending money. Um, the economy is doing fine. Uh, unemployment is very low. If the department stores are closing and people still want to buy stuff, they're going to come to the independent retailer. It's gone full circle. So as a brand trying to target department stores, unless you want to do a private label, a special collection for them, something that you need planograms and kind of, you know, know the people in the inside and what they need and what the margins are, because vendor compliances for a new brand with a department stores 
are tremendous. Like literally the book that comes from like a Macy's or, a, 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 you know, the exceptions would be like Bergdorf and Barney's because they are so friendly towards uh, boutique, I mean, um, independent uh, designers. But And they're almost like a boutique business in themselves. But all the major department stores, their vendor compliances, you have to have EDI, you have you know, their chargebacks, you have to give them terms. Like, how are you going to finance shipping them, you know, when they want 40-day terms or 50-day terms? Like, all of those things people don't consider. And it's the nickels and dimes that will put a new brand out of business. So I don't really know your business. I mean, if you're selling commodities and maybe you're a factory that already is doing business with them and you wanted to do your own private label, that could be an interesting option. But if you're a new brand starting out, department store is definitely not the road to go down. Okay, I have um, another question. And the question is, is there any particular style of handbag you would recommend to wear to the show? To wear to the show? Yes. Oh, so that's that's kind of funny. That, you know, I do have a, um, an opinion surprise on that. You know what I like to do? I like to wear a small crossbody where I have, like, my pen, my stapler, you know, my wallet, like, things handy. And then I do bring a little tote bag where I keep another pair of shoes and, you know, a water bottle and, you know, my battery charger. So I, I do like to bring, like, both a tote bag and a, a, a crossbody with me. Okay, great. You've also mentioned 2.3 and 2.5 and times for margins, but most of the MSRP right. contemporary brands are probably around 2.1. Are you speaking for 2.3 or 2.5 times for Chinese prepacked brands? No. So actually, the, and let's not just say Chinese because there's some Koreans in there too and some Pakistanis and Bangladeshi uh, Indians, but um, if I'm only getting a 2.1 margin, I pass. Because I cannot, and I'm telling you, whoever tells you that you can make a living on keystone they're lying to you. That is such an outdated um, rule of thumb that doesn't apply anymore to today's business. 2.3 is the minimum that I will accept. And that's negotiable with the brand, too. And, you know, um, but again, if you don't want to be the most expensive person selling it, too, and that might be one that you might want to walk away from. But having said that, there are exceptions to every single rule. And if I must have this brand who's giving me such a small margin, then I have to make sure that I have at least two or three brands that I'm getting a 2.5 to a three-time markup so then I can cost average my margins in the store. So in general, right now what we're doing with some of the contemporary brands, that they give us a 2.3 to be honest with you. Uh, a 2.3 margin, we only have 25% of the store that is at a 2.3, and 75% of the store is at three time and higher, especially when it comes to our accessories. And that's why we also do a lot of private label, where we go to some of the vendors at the same show, and we actually take out the labels and put our own brands in. So I know the next question is going to be, is that legal? Absolutely, it's legal. Because so as long as I own the brand that I'm putting into it, and not putting like Gucci or Prada into it, that would be counterfeiting. It's absolutely legal. And it's called private label. And you can go directly to the factories that are at sourcing at Coterie to do that, that they already have product made that you just want to put your name on. And or you could have stuff developed or you could read label some of the stuff that you already buy. So there's three ways of actually doing that. And they're excellent margin builders because then people can go on Amazon and Google price by price and who's got the free shipping going on. Okay. For a new boutique with a limited budget, how do you avoid shopping with brands that have prepacks? Any advice? But see, why are you afraid of prepacks? I mean, usually the brands that have prepacks, they're such at a moderate price point that um, you know it's it's not a bad investment. And also, if you're just buying like size smalls or size mediums, then you're not really having a variety of sizes. Um, and that need to turn over in your store. So, I, I mean, it's a six-piece pre-pack. I wouldn't be too worried about it. And now, let me just make a note, because we do have some clients, like here, I happen to be in Hong Kong, and we have some Asian clients, and uh, they can't sell the largest. So what they do is they already take, even though it's a 
a six piece pre-pack with maybe one large or two large, they take those larges out of the mass and they cost average it based on four pieces and not six pieces. And if you could still get the 4.5 markup on those four pieces, knowing that you have to pretty much throw away the larges, then it's all about the math, and you can afford to do that. Okay, where can we find fashion investors who are not wary of new designers? Um, in heaven. <laughs> Here's a, here's a, I, we work with a lot of investors, and I don't want to be, like, too sarcastic or my New York show too much, but to be honest with you, if you can't afford to have samples and at least get some orders, there, there's not really any interest from fashion investors. They're looking to finance production. So if you can swing getting your, your lookbooks done, your line sheets done, your first samples done, and you actually get tangible orders, from real stores, they will absolutely 100% bank load the production. So that's what you, that's really where the chunk of money goes into. And if that's what you need money for, then call us and we have people for you. And we have one more question. Is there a company at the show that will produce the labels for our boutiques to use private label on our clothing orders? Yes, actually, I, I believe, um, you can just email the concierge service to be 100% sure, but they always have one or two. Um, and the nice thing, here's the really, really nice thing. A lot of the factories actually can provide a service for you in-house. And one more tip when it comes to private label for a retailer, do not use the name of your store. And, and just make up another name or, like, you know, make sure you trademark your name and everything. And I'll tell you why, two reasons. One, if it's really, really successful, you might want to sell it to somebody and you don't want to have to sell your store also. You want to sell it as a separate business. Or just the opposite. If it's a big disaster, you could just blame somebody else and it never had any relationship with your retail store. Okay. We have a few more that have, have come in. As a buyer, if there is a brand I love that has been in all the major magazines but hasn't had the exposure in retail they need, should I take a chance on them? Have you ever taken a chance on an up-and-coming new designer with a lot of new trends and styles? You know, I, I like a variety of both. I mean, the, you, but see, I'm a risk taker, and I tell my clients to be risk takers too. And I, I leave a budget for it. And, you know, it's like only 10% of my budget. But if they're getting a lot of press, press really helps sell. So I would pick that one over the one that was just really more fashion forward. If I had to choose the two. But honestly, I would probably do a little bit for both. Okay, and this is our final question. Any advice for any investors for boutiques? An investor for a boutique? A boutique, so, not not on the design side. Right. So this is here here's my thing about investors and partners. If I'm opening a business and I need an investor or I need a partner. I am already going to advise not to open the boutique because people find partners or investors for a couple of reasons. First, they need money. And money is never a good reason to have somebody own part of your dream, of your, you know, of what you've always wanted. Um, investors come in different forms. If they have something that they bring to the table, like a supply chain, they have maybe they own a building where you really want to be in. That's a different kind of a tangible that's worth more than just money. Because honestly, money is just money. It's not experience. It's not knowledge. It's not power. The other thing I find that people, when they look for a partner, is that they're afraid to do it alone. And that's never a good reason. If you're afraid to do it alone, then this is not the business for you. This is a very aggressive, tough business. And it's really balls to the walls. So if you're not comfortable in making a decision by yourself, you're not going to be comfortable making a decision with another person either. And then the third thing is I find that people want an investor or a partner is because they don't know what they're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing, that's why we're here. That's why there's a lot of professionals out there. There's, you know, agents and consultants and, you know, fashion directors that can help you and guide you and plan out your store and give you good advice. And especially when the advice comes from real experience that they're living in today. So I don't know about finding an investor for a boutique. I 
I am very selfish and greedy. I'd rather you save your money yourself, start humbly, start doing events in the food, start doing, uh, you know, shows or women's expos and start saving your money and living very diligently towards this one goal, and then it's 100% yours. Okay, it looks like we've answered everyone's questions. Um, we hope you found the webinar informative and that we will see you in, in two weeks in New York. And the dates are, again, September 7, 17, 18, and 19. Have a great day. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.